double tap. Okay, so in theory we should be live. Um, I hope that that is working okay. Let's have a look. Uh, that should be fine. Okay. Oh, it's -a me, Luigi. Oh, a lot of people have joined. Hi, welcome. Um, this is uh, the new episode for I Love Cinema and today is the second iteration um, with my coverage from the London Film Festival. All spoiler free. I don't really spoil any films that I talk about, or at least I try to. Um, so if I spoil anything for you, just go like, what's going on? Um, if you've missed the previous iteration coverage from the London Film Festival, that was two weeks ago, because uh, as you can maybe hear, my voice is not the best. So last Thursday, I was actually without a voice, uh, which is why I couldn't actually do a live stream. So all that coverage that was supposed to happen last week will be happening today. I do hope it's not going to be a two hour broadcast, but check it out on uh, either on Twitter, on my Twitter link um, or Twitter. I love cinema blog. There will be a link to the YouTube video um, that's been put up from the uh, previous broadcast, which is, like I said, two hours long covering um, LFF or the films that I had seen up until that point that we are allowed to talk about. And if you check out the YouTube video, make sure to look in the comment section or the description of the video. Um, all the time indexes for the different films that I'm talking about are in there. So in case you're interested in a particular film, it says what time index on the video you have to scroll to in order to find out my thoughts on that. Makes it a lot easier because I'm not expecting you to watch an entire two hour video of me talking about films that you might not be interested in. And obviously I need to have my trusty tea because my voice is absolutely shambles. So let's dive right in because we have a lot of stuff to cover. So the first one, that was the opening film of the London Film Festival, which has officially started for the general public yesterday. And that is uh, the film called Widows by Steve McQueen. Hey there, Kai, how are you doing? And uh, Widows is uh, the synopsis, well, not really synopsis, but what they write in the program, because I didn't have time to check the synopsis. Academy Award winner and BFI fellow Steve McQueen of 12 Years a Slave and Hunger and Shame opens the festival in pulsating style with this female-fueled heist thriller that features a cast to die for. And it is a cast to die for because we have Viola Davis, Michelle Rodriguez, Elizabeth Debicki, Cynthia Erivo, Colin Farrell, Liam Neeson, and um, Danielle Kaluuya is in it as well. So there's a lot of really amazing people in this film. And obviously the main reason why I want to see it is because of Viola Davis, because she's just amazing. Um, if you've never seen Viola Davis in a movie or in her TV show, um, How to Get Away with Murder, you need to check that out because this woman is really, really powerful. And she is the same here in Widows. Um, and if you follow me on Twitter, you've probably seen my initial reaction to the film that I posted yesterday that um, maybe I should look these. Oh, no, I can't really look it up because I'm broadcasting from my phone um, and my computer is buggered. So, yeah, the usual. I, can you believe that I actually bought uh, I ordered a new laptop? It will arrive in a few weeks. So woohoo. But we have Viola Davis, um, who plays Liam Neeson's wife in the film. And one of the things that uh, my, was my initial reaction about Widows was that I expected this, just judging from the trailer, which looked amazing, I thought that this was going to be a very girl power kind of film, you know, very, um, God, my hair's a mess, very woman fronted. <clears throat> and of course, the, the four, well, sort of three female leads. They're really great, they're really powerful, and especially Viola Davis. It's, it's like, she, she has a little doggy, a really cute doggy. And usually they say it's like you should never share the screen with a dog or a really cute pet, because you will always be upstaged by said pet. And Viola Davis manages not just to hold her own with this really adorable puppy, but upstage the puppy, so to speak. She's that, she's that good. Um, and... Yeah, it wasn't as much of a girl power film as I thought it would be because the film actually is more interested in the in the schemes and the narrative of its plot. And it's all about like political stuff and intrigue and schemes and backstabbing and gangster and 
then you have the women come in who are basically trying to sort the situation out. But I didn't feel like it was necessarily... The, obviously, the emphasis is on these ladies who are widows, hence the title. Um, and thank you very much for, for providing us with a free copy of the book. I can't wait to read that. Um, but overall, I thought the... Um, the emphasis would be a lot more on these women um, because especially Liam Neeson's character gets a lot of screen time as well and I was a bit like I, I want to see the ladies in action I thought the ladies have like uh, money problems because of their husbands dying which is by the way a really fantastic sequence that starts off the film um, in a that, there, there was a lot of like really weird reactions I've had to the opening five minutes of the movie uh, because I think the first shot is you seeing Viola Davis and Liam Neeson in bed, making out, kissing with tongue. And I was like, why am I seeing this? This is just really weird. It's like, why am I lingering on this? It's like, you could have shown me in some other way, shape or form that these guys are a couple, that they're married or whatever. And I was like, why are you showing me their tongue action? I don't need to see that. But maybe that's just me. But I, I was a bit weirded out by that. Then it goes kaboom crash into a parallel montage of the boys basically doing some kind of a heist or or gig or something. <clears throat> so they're clearly gangsters or or criminals at least. Um, while their corresponding wives are going about their own business. So you're really introducing all of these characters in pretty much in five minutes, and it goes out with a bang because obviously the men have to die, right? Hence the whole title. Um, but then I thought it would totally go into the story of the women and that they then have money problems or something and they need to alleviate these money problems, which is why they think of doing this heist. And I thought that was the whole film. But there's so much more. There's like layer upon layer upon layer, which is usually something that I'm really a fan of. But in this, I thought it detracted from what I came to see, which is these women in action doing their thing. Um, and I felt like only half the movie or maybe two thirds of the movie was about them and the rest was about the boys or other boys that were somehow, sorry, men <laughs> who were somehow connected to, to the guys that died. Um, and I was like, I, d I don't need to see that. I don't want to see that. And I understand that you're just trying to to make like a, a political slash heist thriller out of this that has women headlining. But I thought it was more about the actual heist the women were trying to make. It's sort of like Ocean's 8, but less camp. Um, but that's not what it is. It is more a thriller and it, it, with an ensemble cast, not just the ladies. Um, so I was uh, I was a bit disappointed because I thought I was I was clearly going to see a film driven by these women and, and to a certain extent it is but it's not as much as I thought there would be there's a lot of screen time dedicated to a gangster who wants to become a politician and which is kind of funny because to me politicians are criminals and gangsters so it's like pff, much of a muchness right and then you have Colin Farrell who's um Farrell Farrell <laughs> sorry who's uh who is a politician and who's kind of like connected to the guys that you know um were the husbands of the widows and it's like all this interconnectedness of so many different characters and then later on there's a twist upon twist and a turn upon the turn and I was like I, I don't need all of that I would have been just happy with seeing a heist movie headlined by these amazing ladies and Viola Davies obviously she's a powerhouse of a lady and she is exactly that in this film but I wanted to see more same with Michelle Rodriguez who doesn't really get much to do in this uh, Elizabeth Debicki She's just amazing in whatever she does. Like she, She's one of those memorable people that immediately sticks out. And she doesn't just stick out because she's the tall, pale blonde, even though she is ginormous. Um, but there's, and there's another character, and I, I forgot what her name is. Um, is that Cynthia Ergo, potentially? She's like the fourth person um, that comes into the gang and she's a great addition and her, especially her interaction with Viola Davis because they're the only two black women in there is quite fantastic because they come from different socioeconomic backgrounds. Um, 
there's a lot of really good stuff in there. And when the, the the setup to the heist and how they go about researching it, because obviously they have no experience, that is quite well done. And the characters are really well thought out and every uh, actor really takes on their role. And I thought it works really well. And I had a lot of fun with that, seeing them work together because they're such really different people, all four of them, and how they all grow to an extent and um, how it all fits together. Then there are certain twists and turns and surprises that aren't really much of a surprise, maybe more so to the character, but not really a surprise to the audience. And I was like, you don't need to play with my expectations. I know exactly what's behind this door and I know exactly what this is and what's going to happen here. Um, and it's very cliche and it's very by the numbers, but the actors make it work. Um, and then, of course, the end, there's like a big twist there. And then everything is quite predictable. And I I wasn't quite sure. I couldn't put my finger on it why I didn't, why, why it didn't wow me. You know, I thought this was going to wow me because it's going to be a female-driven film. It's going to be headlined by Viola Davis, who I like. What can go wrong, right? And for whatever reason, it just, it didn't click with me. It's a really good film. I, I enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun with it. It's very entertaining. It has, like I said, twists and turns. It's also quite dramatic. But overall, it didn't have much of heart and soul, which I was really surprised by. And I've only found out today, really, or I realized it today, when I watched another movie um, that I'm going to be talking about. Oh, sorry, that's the, oh, that's the wrong system. That one, Colette which was uh, screening today uh, for the general public as well, or is screening at the moment, something like that. Um, and when I watched Colette and when I walked out of Colette, I, I was buzzing, you know, I, I, I had like an emotional reaction to it and it, it stuck with me and I was whistling some of the score as I walked out. Like this film really stuck with me and this film really, um, struck me somehow had a had a reaction um, within me like even just like a bodily reaction and an emotional reaction whereas widows left me very very blank um, as in like I I enjoyed the film and I I had a good two hours I was entertained I wasn't bored or anything but I wasn't emotionally involved and that to me is a huge problem if I'm not emotionally involved in a film then the film kind of fails for me on a certain level um, which is why I, I would recommend Widows if you like, if you like anything to do with crime, if you like heist thrillers, if you like thrillers to a certain extent, if you like Viola Davis, you need to go and check it out anyway. Um, it's a really well-performed film, but overall it feels a bit lackluster and soulless. It's very by the numbers, so it's not as amazing or girl powery as I thought it was going to be. So just keep that in mind if you go and see it. Whereas Colette is pretty much the exact opposite of Widows. I didn't really know what to expect from this. I, I hadn't heard of the author. Uh, let's see what it says. Forget what you know about costume dramas. This witty Belle Epoque era biopic stars Kira Knightley and Dominic West as literary couple Colette and Willie, whose relationship rewrote social and gender rules. So this is based upon Sidney Gabrielle Colette, who was a French uh, writer in the early 20th century. Um, and that was before women really were, you know, successful or commercially successful writers and she was pretty much a bit of a sensation um i didn't know anything about the story all, all i knew is it was a period drama and it starred kira knightley and apparently it's really good so i went to go and see it and then one of the first things that really struck me so obviously you already know because i i, I walked out of there buzzing so i had a really good experience i really like this film i actually love this movie and I love her performance and I love a lot of the performances in this. Uh, her, uh, Kira Knightley and Dominic West are absolutely phenomenal in this. And you have to go and say it. Um, but one of the things, because I didn't know anything about it, because I hadn't read about it, I didn't do any research, because that's kind of how I prefer to watch movies. The, le the less I know, the better. Um, because otherwise you have preconceived notions and yada, yada, yada. 
So all I knew is she was a writer. I'd watched the trailer. All I knew is she was a writer. Her husband's a writer who kind of takes her writing as his own. Um, just like husbands used to take a lot of things as their own back then. Um, well, maybe even today. Let's not get into that discussion. But one of the things that struck me when the movie starts, and obviously her name's Colette, right? So there's a point to there. But I was so surprised when I saw her writing in French. And I was like, of course, her name's Colette. So yeah, it's French. So what the entire thing is set in France. All these people are supposed to be French people. And it totally threw me. It's like Kira Knightley and Dominique West, they, they, they obviously the British, they, they have like period drama looks, period drama accents, sort of. And I was under the initial impression that this was based in the UK. And then all of a sudden it was like, we're, uh, we're in Normandy or something. I think she's, she's a country girl from Normandy, if I remember correctly. Uh, he's from Paris. So before I was paying proper attention, I was like, oh, wow, he goes to Paris a lot. So he goes like out of the country, you know, overseas, so to speak. He goes to continental Europe. Um, and then when she, I think she starts writing a letter or something. And I was like, I can't read this. Hang on a minute. This is French. Why is she writing in French? And then st stuff started to click into place. And I was like, hang on a minute. The movie's called Colette. And... No, this is set in France. I had no idea. That's how little I knew of this movie. I literally knew absolute zero. So I find it a bit weird that a film that is completely set in France, why are all the characters English? Why are all the characters British? It's, it's just so weird. Like no one's even trying to pretend to have a French accent. It's like they couldn't be ours. Are they, I don't know, are they trying to you know, proclaim, it's like, we're going to take this story and we're going to make it British. It, it just felt so weird hearing everyone with their posh British accents while clearly seeing all the writing that's happening on screen is in French. So that really threw me that, that for whatever reason, that totally took me out of it every single time. I was like, what's up with this? That just doesn't fit. That just doesn't gel really well. It was really, really weird. Aside from that, I thought, like I said, Kira Knightley is fantastic. Dominic West holds his own. I mean, he's a great actor anyway. We, we all know how amazing he is. But Kira Knightley really shines in this. And what is really interesting about the character, um, I had heard it alluded to, but like I said, I didn't know anything about her. Um, this character was quite uh, modern back in the day. So she was um, one of the first, if not the first woman to actually publish a novel and publish it to commercial success. Um, and her husband basically is, he, he's sort of like the, like the head figure of the company, but he gets other people to write for him. So he's more the branding than the actual creative artist behind everything um, and if you've seen the trailer obviously you know that, that that's not really news to you um, and then sooner or later she realizes that that is just not okay and that she deserves recognition um, and they have quite an interesting up and down relationship but you can tell that they they sort of kind of love each other but in like a really weird way and that makes it very interesting to follow their relationship so all the ups and downs, not just relationship wise, but also professionally. Um, and what I thought was really interesting, especially given the time, is that the movie also doesn't shy away from exploring Colette's um, a queer aspects. So she was someone who was interested in both men and women. And the movies usually shy away from showing the homoerotic side of it, but this one doesn't. Um, so they openly talk about it, that she's more, that she's, for example, more attracted to, to the wife than to the husband that she was talking to earlier. And then they even show a sort of sexual relationship. Uh, well, it is a sexual relationship between her and another woman um, that her husband's perfectly fine with. But as a lot of men, he wouldn't be perfectly fine if she started fucking another man. Um, and then what the film goes even further, 
and she meets another well I want to see another woman but that woman seems to identify as a man uh, even though everyone knows this person is is a woman but the person uses the he pronouns um, and wants to be addressed as he dresses like a man I, even though the name that's being used is still female Missy and it was quite interesting um, that the movie how the movie depicts that particular person and fully embraces the gender issues and the identity issues and how Colette embraces that as well and what kind of effect it has on her so I thought it was quite a modern how should I say not not, not a modern way to 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 see it or depict it but considering that this happened like a hundred years ago um, but it's, it's really it, it feels really fresh and it feels really authentic even though obviously I don't really know much about this person so I can't really comment on how authentic it is but I love this film I love the portrayal I I love the the different characters that we get to see especially Colette and her husband Willie um, that the film doesn't shy away from showing the queer side of things as well because that is usually something that is either omitted or just hinted at but here it is clearly shown um, and I was I was really surprised by that because the first time like you see Colette and and Willie having sex and it's quite tame and you basically don't see anything and then when she starts having her affair with the woman all of a sudden it becomes a lot more sexual and open and you see a lot more nakedness and skin and I thought that was quite interesting because usually it's the other way around um, so obviously it's not an LG <laughs> it's not an LGBT film but it has you can add that classification to it so if that's a type of film that you're usually interested in this one um, I think represents really well especially given the time period that it depicts uh, but you don't necessarily need to be into queer issues to go and see Colette this is more like a feminist film it's about identity and about sticking up for yourself It's about equality so I think this is a movie that any woman would appreciate to watch and the depiction um, with Keira Knightley as Colette is fantastic the only main gripe I had with the film is once it was over there was a lot of um, what do you call them like the like the cue cards at the end like explanatory text at the very end where it was basically saying and then this happened and then that happened and this and that and that and I was like you're a movie you're not supposed to tell me these things you're supposed to show me these things and the movie unfortunately doesn't have the time to also show you this so it feels like after you watch the film you kind of feel like you want a sequel because there's still so much to delve into in this person's life that would be really really interesting to see um, because obviously if you've seen the trailer you know that she writes for her husband and the husband publishes it under his name but then she realizes that she should be given um, the, the copyright or, or, or the name bearing of the title because she is the actual writer and I thought it would be more about the process of that like when they go like she, she's probably taken him to court or something in order to make that happen and that's one thing I know about her that she did get these titles published under her own name they were associated with her she won whatever court case she went for and I thought that that would be part of the film but it actually is not it's alluded in these text cards at the very end um, which I thought was a bit of a letdown um, but then the movie is quite I'm actually not sure what the running time is hang on let's see running time is 112 minutes so just shy of two hours and it's chock full of stuff so it's more about how they get together and what their relationship is like and how she comes to terms with who she is and how she sees herself and what's important to her and all of that is really interesting and Kira Knightley is quite mesmerizing and captivating like you're with her all the way it's like there's, there's never a scene where you're not interested in what she's doing what she's thinking and considering the time period it, it plays in she is very forward-thinking and very much you know 
not not just sitting quietly in the corner and just taking it all. She gives her husband hell, and it's it's just really refreshing to see. And I really enjoyed that. Just from a performance point of view, I thought the film was really good. It's shot beautifully. The score is fantastic, even though I I didn't really notice it much. But as I walked out of the cinema, I caught myself whistling or or at least going humming some of the score. And and I was like, wow, that really got to me. And I was I was literally like I was really giddy and I was buzzing. I was just walking out going like, yeah, that was good. Um, so I really enjoyed that. And I think if you get a chance to watch Colette at the London Film Festival or anywhere else, um, I think it will probably have a normal release uh, as well. But it showed today. Um, it showed today twice, actually. You can catch it tomorrow at 11.30 and, and on Saturday at 6 p.m. So maybe you can still grab a bunch of tickets for that. I highly recommend it. It was really good. If you're into equality, feminist issues, um, you know, girl power kind of a thing, even though it is a period piece of which I'm usually not a fan, this is definitely the film for you. It's really, really good and I highly recommend it. All right, what do we have next? Oh, that was another one that I was watching today. Um, sorry to bother you. Um, let's have a look. Where is that in here? Let's have a look. Um, that was a film that I'd also seen the trailer for and I was really surprised um, by how much fun it actually was because that it's it looks like it's going to have a lot of social commentary. Sorry to bother you, why can't I find it? It's not in here. How is that possible? No, it's actually called Sorry to Bother You. It's not in here okay interesting that is weird um but this title it basically has uh what's his name oh god i didn't write it down because i thought i could just read it from here and now it's not in here so it's a basically a social commentary film um if you've have, is someone calling me? You gotta be kidding me! Um, if you've, uh, oh, sorry guys, I'm I'm just like trying to put it all together, but I can't believe that it's actually not in here. How is that possible? I think you give everything is in here except for sorry, sorry to bother you. How is that possible? Yeah, it's not in here. Um, okay, uh, so, synopsis for so Sorry to Bother You. So we, we have this guy, I can't remember his name in, in, in the film, um, and he basically is without a job, um, and he's trying to get a job. And the way that he's try going about trying to get a job is, is kind of hilarious and interesting and different uh, than you usually would. So he gets a job as a telemarketer and he's not very good at it at first because they always go stick to the script. Um, and then if you've seen the trailer, you know that someone goes, it's like, oh, it's because you sound like a black dude. You have to put on a white dude's um, voice. And as soon as he does that, he becomes very successful as a telemarketer. And then it just like he his career just skyrockets basically. Um, hi, uh, two viewers. I'm not entirely sure who it is, um, but hello and welcome. I'm talking about the films that I've seen at the London Film Festival. Spoiler free. There's no spoilers happening here. Um, so in sorry to bother you. So he basically becomes this telemarketer, and then there's like all kinds of shit happening um, in regards to. Uh, the social commentary of things. I'm I'm not sure how much I want to talk about this because it's actually quite hilarious and quite poignant, but in a really bizarre and over the top kind of way. Um, there's a there's a company that basically takes our matrix like lives and factory worker like lives to such an extreme extreme that you just can't help but laugh every time you see it. But the funny thing is that, like, we ha I had a lot of fellow press members laughing at this, hilariously laughing at this, even though I was looking at it going like, I know you're playing it for laughs and it's funny, 
but it's actually kind of scary and frightening and sad because it looks like we're moving towards this where it's basically saying it's like you don't have to worry about anything you don't have to worry about your future work for us we will take care of you for the rest of your life but you will work for us for free but we will take care of you for the rest of your life um, I think it was called working life or something like that um, and of course behind all of that is one ginormous corporation that is just raking in the profits right no surprise there um, and there are certain people who are down on their luck and who just can't afford stuff. They can't pay their bills. They don't have a job or if they have a job, it doesn't pay enough. You know, there's a lot of people in, in this, in this world that have to go through that. People that have like two or three jobs just to make ends meet and they're working their asses off and they hardly have enough money to pay their bills. And that's just outrageous. You know, if you work 40 hours a week, you should make enough money to pay rent and pay your bills. And have a family you know um, whereas we have other people who hardly do anything and they rake in all the money so this is basically a social commentary on the um, inequality that is happening in especially in the industrialized world obviously um, but also where we're going towards in regards to uh, our working lives and corporations running the world and how we're all just focused on making more and more money or we're all focused on making money, period, because we have to pay our rent, we have to pay our bills. And then on top of that, it's like, you want to have a nice car, you want to have a nice house, you want to have this, you want to have that, and blah, blah, blah. And that's basically what the film is about. And it does that in a really hilarious way. Like, this is one of the most entertaining films that I've seen. But at the same time, while it is laugh out loud, funny and entertaining, it's also really scary when you actually look at it going like, you're making it a bit over the top and extreme and farcical. However, you are not very far from the truth. And that is sad and tragic and scary at the same time. So I didn't really laugh out loud much, uh, as much as everyone else around me. I was more appalled <laughs> and shocked by the film because it, it just rings too true in, in all its horrificness. And I was like, flipping egg. Like, this is really pretty much a wake-up call for potentially a lot of people. Um, but it's, it's really entertaining, and the actors are great. Tessa Thompson plays his girlfriend, and she is just absolutely fantastic. I have no idea. Like, all of a sudden, like, what, two years ago, she just poof, popped up on the scene? Well, well, the first time I noticed her was in Thor Ragnarok. Um, but all of a sudden, she's in everything, and she chooses her projects really wisely, and I really love what she does, and how diverse the characters are that she plays, so she's really good, and she's someone to watch out for. I love seeing her. Like, the entire time, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure. I was like, is that Tessa Thompson? It kind of looks like Tessa Thompson, but I'm not entirely sure, but it was her. I checked in the credits, and she's phenomenal, and he's great. Um, everyone, really, in, in this film is really, really good. The characters are well thought out the performers have a lot of fun playing their characters they play with the over the top extremeness and bizarreness and in the third act the film really goes bonkers and i don't want to say too much there because i don't want to give anything away it's it's almost going a bit too surreal and extreme and ridiculous but it definitely is bringing its point across and, and, and bringing it home. Um, and I thought it worked really well. It's one of the films that you need to have seen. If you're into anything regarding like politics or social commentary, but with like a really funny and entertaining twist... Like this, this film, it doesn't ask you to, to be aware of all the shit that's happening. And it's not going like, oh, by the way, do you know about this? Do you know about that? Have you ever thought about this and that? It's, it's more like you can definitely just watch this and kick back and just enjoy it for its bizarre and wild ride. And that's exactly what it is. And then, like I said, in the third act, it goes a bit fantastical and absolutely bonkers. Either that works for you or it doesn't. And I think this is this might be potentially where the film either sinks or swims for a lot of people. Because the film's already quite extreme in its setup to all of that, it worked for me. I just embraced the ridiculousness that I was staring at on screen. And it is seriously ridiculous. 
but it it makes its point and it's also once the film is over it the entire time the film knows exactly what it is and what it's trying to do and if it's that self-aware it really works like the filmmaker what's his name B -b -b Boots Riley he really knows how to work comedy and that is one of the things that is so absolutely fantastic about Sorry to Bother You. So if you get a chance to watch this, I think this is one of the highlights of the film festival. Just like Colette is, just like Lizzie is and the Bill Murray stories. You know, there's like a lot of really good stuff. And this is definitely one of it. And I, but I think this is probably going to get a normal, like a standard cinema release anyway. But just in case, if you can catch this at the London Film Festival definitely give it a watch what do we have now sticks okay that's the one that I literally just got home from it's a German film by oh, what's his name Wolfgang Fischer who was also in or who is in attendance at the London Film Festival um, he did a Q&A after the film and you can find uh, a transcript of that soonish on the fancarpet.com um, which is a website uh, associated with me or I'm associated with. Um, so this film was very, very interesting. Um, I like the name, um, something to do with the river sticks. In case you don't know what that is, just Google it. <laughs> um, it's, oh, actually, let's have a look. This might be in here because I think I've seen it in here. And let's, let's just read the synopsis of what it is. 54. There we go sticks there we go um a woman's solo sailing journey turns into a deadly serious ethical dilemma in this unusual and taught political allegory um so it's about a sailing trip so most of it like i think 99 percent of the film is actually happening on water you're in the atlantic ocean or on the atlantic ocean and it's pretty much just one protagonist which is uh susanna wolf who's the um the sailor, so to speak. And she is trying to sail, I think, from Gibraltar down to some Darwinian island uh, in like west of Africa, something like that. And on her way there, she comes across a another boat that is going through some problems. But it's quite a big boat and it's got a lot of people on it. And she's on a two uh, on a 12 meter yacht on her own and so she's clearly not um not capable of taking care of all of these people on that other boat right but she has this dilemma of she calls the coast guard and she's like there's this boat these are the coordinates there there are people in distress there you need to send the coast guard and then people are not sending the coast guard and she's like well i'm not going away from here until i see the coast guard um, because the problem is that all the people on the other boat that are in distress are black. They're, they seem to be of African descent. And she's very worried that the Coast Guard is potentially not coming to rescue them. Because, you know, given the climate, we find a lot of black people, African people, disposable. Whereas if a white person was in in problematic uh, territory, in hazardous boat territory, we would send the Coast Guard with flying colors, that kind of thing. And of course, it's an allegory in regards to the refugee crisis that we're going through and, and a lot of other stuff. But what the movie really, and, and that's all I want to say in regards to what it um, what it's about and and what happens, because you don't want to give too much away. Um, it's really well shot. It's literally just one woman on a boat. Every now and then she has radio contact with someone else. Um, there's a bunch of other, there's a bunch of scenes. I think there's like two scenes at the start of the film. I'm not entirely sure why they're in the film. Um, there's something basically setting the scene. Hi, you're in Gibraltar. And then the next scene, something happens and someone needs to attend to an accident. And it turns out it's the woman who is then sailing away. Why we needed that introduction so that we know that she's a doctor or at least a paramedic. Um, 
I, I don't understand. It, it felt like it, it, it totally felt disconnected to me. It felt unnecessary to me. If the movie had just started with her loading up all her provisions and, and supplies onto her yacht and then sailing down there, I, I didn't need the, the first few scenes because throughout the entire film, I was actually going like, what were those scenes supposed to tell me? Like, there must be a connection with the people on the boat or something. So I was thinking all like widows, you know, layers upon layers, schemes and intrigue and all of that shit. So I was overthinking it. And I was like, what, what were you trying to tell me? Um, so I'm not entirely sure. Like, I would have cut that. Like, I find those scenes absolutely unnecessary. But once she's on the water and you can see that she, she clearly knows how to sail by herself and it's beautiful and lonesome and you know the tranquility of it all and the beauty of the sea and I have a thing for open water even though I'm scared of open water but I also have like an affinity for open water so it's like what can I say I'm a complicated person but the the cinematography is really great you get quite wide shots that I was like did they use drones but I was like no there's no way that this was shot with a drone because it's too still um, and it turns out the director later on said that they they were shooting in Gibraltar, in Malta, and I think in Kenya. But they used the like the high point in Malta and the high point in Gibraltar, who, which are very really, very really small countries, right? They used that, and then just did a far shot, so you could see the boat by itself in the middle of the ocean. Um, obviously, the Mediterranean is not an ocean, but you know what I mean. Um, and it looks fantastic. It is so beautiful. And she also, obviously, she, you know, she's sailing by herself. So it's like in a drift. You, there's got to be a storm somewhere, right? Um, but it doesn't have the effect that you think it, it's going to have. And it's just interesting to see her working through the moral dilemma of there are people in need. What do I do? And obviously, because it's been established, she's a doctor. Uh, in the opening scene, even though you didn't need that because later on she even says it's like I'm a doctor It's like there you go. You didn't need the the front scene. Hey Felix. How you doing? Um, so that 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 kind of negated the first The first scene of the film almost it's like you didn't need the establishing Shot of her as a doctor later on in the film. She actually says to someone on the radio. It's like I'm a doctor so clearly negating the need for that but you know, that, that's just me being finicky. But overall, I really loved the film, even though not much is happening in it. But there's always tension. There's always something going on. And you can feel what she's going through. And you're kind of going through it with her. And she's very engaging. And it's just, it's just phenomenal. The way that, like, just telling you, it's like, yeah, she, she's sailing from Gibraltar down uh, the west coast of Africa and then something happens and she's in a moral conundrum and we're not entirely sure of how she's going to get out of it and that's pretty much the entire film and that doesn't sound like much but the film is really captivating and engaging and I was just sitting through there going like well what's going on and what's happening and it's all about choices and consequences and and I really love that because that's what life is like, right? Choices and consequences. So this film works really well. And of course, if you don't know what the River Styx is, which is what the film is named after, the River Styx is the river in, in is it Greek mythology, I think, um, that separates uh, the living world from the dead world. Um, you know, the, 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 the ferryman, if, if that's what you say it in, in English, he, he ferries people on the river Styx into the underworld, so to speak. Um, so just the title itself, because I knew what that meant, or that is what I associated with. And then in the Q&A, the director was like, yeah, this is what it's meant. This, this is why we chose this title, because you're, you're like skirting, you're on the edge between the living and the dead. Uh, which makes a lot of sense. So that already intrigued me. Then that it's about a solo sailing trip, about the open water. I was like, yeah, all of that really, really fascinates me and interests me. So I had to go and see it. And I saw it tonight and it was totally worth it. So if you get a chance to see this, it's screening again on Saturday the 13th. 
so um, put that in your calendar. Maybe you can still get tickets for that. I highly recommend it. It was a lot of fun. Well, fun might not be the right word, but it is definitely a film that I enjoyed watching on the big screen because the cinematography of the water is just, it just gets to me. And, and also the sound design of, of the waves and everything is just... Yeah, that really got to me. I, I really, really liked that. It was so well done. Definitely kudos to Wolfgang Fischer. Recommend it. All right, what else we have? Border. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Border is a film that I had the pleasure of interviewing the director earlier today, which was quite interesting. Uh, and uh, 17... And I apologize for my voice because it's still a bit shoddy, but I, I'm doing my best. Um, let's see what it says here. Border. Prepare for a love story like no other in this audacious Scandinavian fantasy based on a novel by the writer of Let the Right One In. So that should roughly set the scene for you. If you know what Let the Right One In, which was uh, like a vampire story, um, a Swedish film, uh, quite renowned, like critically acclaimed. Uh, I still, I know it's been years. I still haven't seen it. I, I know I'm rubbish. And they already did an American version of that. I was like, mm. but so the dude who wrote that also wrote a short story. I think it's called Border as well. And then we have Ali Abbasi, the director of Border. He came across. Um, well, when I interviewed him earlier, he said that he really liked Let the Right One In. So he looked up the person that wrote that and then found this short story that Border is based on. And he was really mesmerized by it. He was like, that, that would make a great film. And so he just took it and ran with it. And one of the things is we've got um, a woman called Tina. She is a Swedish customs guard and she seems to have some kind of like special power. Like she, she's like a sniffer dog people are walking past her and she can just sniff and go like this guy's got something and then they put him to the side and they go through his luggage and every time she says this one that person has something on them that is illegal for whatever reason it can be booze or someone i i think someone had kitty porn on them and stuff and it's, it's really bizarre and i was like why the hell how how can she like fair enough how someone can potentially sniff booze right it's got some smell but how can you smell a usb stick with kitty porn um and then you have like all kinds of different theories of what that might be potentially and it, it gets interesting when uh, she uh, before i say that it's like she has these special powers so to speak she's like a superhero but what immediately gets your attention is that she has a very very interesting look she looks she looks like a neanderthal she has these really harsh features she has these weird teeth she's very hairy um she looks like a a not very delicate version of a human like we're, we're used to everything looking like this and and like her her eyes are a bit deeper in there and and the 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 bone structure is a lot more prominent um and yeah the teeth as well and everything is a bit more animalistic so to speak and she is quite animalistic as well because she always like she sniffs everything and she has this heightened sense of smell and i think heightened sense of a lot of other things as well but like the sniffing thing is kind of like her sixth sense kind of like a superpower so i was like oh wow she she is a bit of an aberration or a bit abnormal but she's got some kind of superpower for that and like i said i don't want to spoil too much um i i don't really want to spoil anything so then sooner or later we come across a male equivalent of hers um, that, that she comes across and then all of a sudden it's like what's going on and that's when all your theories like your brain cells fire on all cylinders it's like, and your theories are just driving you insane it could be in this it could go there bam, bam, bam. and it doesn't go, like I, I had a lot of really weird theories but what actually happens in the film and I'm not going to tell you is so bonkers that I couldn't think of that 
and it was really really bizarre and the entire film is it, it's kind of like about belonging and being other and about identity and personal freedom and it is very very powerful it's almost like the film holds up a mirror to humanity or to everyone's humanity it's all about the the perception of of beauty or the perception of 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 goodness so to speak um we we have a bunch of people here that look potentially monstrous and then we come across some people in the film who look normal but are monsters deep inside right and it's this whole perception of who is good and who is evil and who is beautiful and who isn't and what actually is beauty is it like the superficial thing or is it what's deep inside and and then like I said personal freedom and identity and 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 where you belong and all of that stuff and the film is really fantastic in that regard and I don't want to give more than that away but there's a lot of in, in the second half there's a lot of discoveries happening for you as the audience for for Tina as the character it's it's phenomenal it's absolutely phenomenal and um yeah also check out the fan carpet for a transcript of the interview with the director um let's see what roughly what he was saying um so yeah he, he was it was influenced by what what if we had a story like shrek but it wasn't funny it wasn't fun it was tragic and dark that's kind of what border is um and he mentioned because uh, i asked about um, the makeup and the evolution of the makeup that they went for with the two Neanderthal lookalikes, basically. Um, and he he said it's like that. That's one of the memorable moments during production, that he uh, walked into the makeup trailer, and uh, what's her name, Eva Eva Melander. She plays Tina. She she's quite a prolific actress in Sweden, and she just had the prosthetics put on and he didn't know that he walked into the makeup trailer and he basically wanted to see how it was going or something and she opened the door and he was not ready for it and he was so taken aback by it because he looked at her and she looked so weird and different and alien but it was Eva deep down like it was her eyes you know, and, and he, he was basically saying it's like my, my brain just like it didn't compute. I didn't really understand what I was seeing. And that's how I knew that the makeup worked. And they also took her just through town in full makeup just to see <coughs> just to see what kind of reaction people would have to her. And that's how they basically knew it's like this is the makeup that we're going to have because it was really, really fantastic. Um, so that was that was really cool. Um, and yeah, it's the whole delving below the surface, really finding out what makes people tick and who they really are. And, you know, just like forget about what, what's on the surface because we really want to know who people are deep down. Um, and the dreamlike surrealism that you have in the film especially in the second half especially in the last act there's like a lot of stuff where you're like what the heck am i looking at but it really works and it is such a yeah it's, it's like an allegory a metaphor it's, it's it's just it's so it can be so profound depending on how you interpret it it's like it's quite open to interpretation but it's also it, it definitely steers you in a certain direction. So it's steering you kind of where the director wants you to go. But then, because film is an art form, it leaves you open to interpreting however you see fit. But it is, it is like a fantastical tale of a folklore slash myth that you're watching there. So just because the title is called Border and it's about Tina, the customs officer, doesn't mean that this is about borders between countries because it's not um this is definitely it falls into the fantasy genre um into the folklore genre but it is 
as fantastical as it is, it is very grounded in reality. And that is something that apparently to the to the director, um, it was really important that it is grounded and that these characters feel real and that we don't we don't just live in the folklore and the mythical and, and the fantastical, that we also do live in the real world. Um, that was very important to him and I think that really worked. The cinematography also looks quite interesting. Um, it's very really realistic. It almost feels like you're watching like a CSI episode, but you're watching so much more, even though she gets involved in like a, a police investigation. Um, and I, for me, the first half, I was like, she, she's going to turn out to be like a superhero. She's going to be like, this is going to be like a Marvel thing. And, and she, she's going to go like, yeah, I'm, I'm like the sniffer person. Um, that's not what it was. It, it definitely is a fantastical thing. It is a folklore thing. So just keep that in mind. It's got something to do with like, you, you could say it's like, like a Nordic noir film or something. It's really, really wicked and bizarre and a bit bonkers, but I really loved it. Um, be because you just have to exp embrace these extremes that, that it shows because everything just works so well together. And um, they won an award at Cannes as well. And I I think it's really well deserved. And they're the official selection for Sweden for the foreign language Oscar. Um, so keeping my fingers crossed. I really enjoyed this film. It was very interesting. It really surprised me in the third act. It went in a direction I did not see coming by a mile. So... Very surprising, very interesting, great acting, great performances. Um, also very, very dark and unsettling. So keep that in mind. If, if you want to watch something lighthearted, this ain't it. But I highly recommend you go and watch that. Um, that is out. So there's one tomorrow and next Wednesday it's showing again. So definitely go and give Border a watch. What else we got? Girl. Okay. Now... Let's see, where is Girl? That also falls under the um, LGBT umbrella, uh, like Lizzie, like um, uh, Colette, uh, which is quite nice. So Girl, we have a transgender teenager dreams of becoming a ballet dancer in this extraordinary coming of age story, which won the queer palm at this year's Cannes Film Festival. So there you go, this is another a winner at the Cannes Film Festival and uh, deservedly so I think because this film was really fantastic. Um, I love the portrayal of it. We have uh, a guy called Victor Proctor. Was it Proctor? Poster? Polster. Victor Polster. Sorry. Victor Polster who is playing ah uh, what's her name? Lara. Right. Who's playing Lara who's like 16 years old in the film and obviously is transgender is quite obviously transgender and the dynamic between her and the dad there's also a smaller brother and you're pretty much sure that you know this is not your typical 15 16 year old girl and then the little brother opens up and goes like and calls her laura and you're like oh okay it's kind of like setting setting the mood setting the picture um and it's going through the coming of age story of this particular person going through the the, the change um, and having the whole discussion about like hormone treatment and the surgery and stuff, uh, which is obviously something that happens very, very early. This person is like 15 or 16 years old um, and the dad is, is fully behind all of that. Um, but then the person, uh, Lara, also goes through the rather rigorous training of uh, wanting to be a ballet dancer and starting at a very prestigious ballet school. And that is obviously something that is really, uh, well, it's not easy. And uh, that puts a lot of strain on the body and, and mentality and stuff. And then there are people that are okay with you being transgender and then there are people who are not okay with you being transgender. And some people who seemingly are okay, but then turn out to be a twat, maybe just for a moment, but twat is a twat. Um, so it's like all the stuff that, you know, you have to go through as an, as an adolescent on top of having to go through your transgender change um, and having to have the patience to wait for it all. And 
I'm not transgender, so I cannot even remotely relate or, or, or don't want to like say anything in that regard or how well this is depicted because obviously I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, right? Um, I've heard outcry from the transgender community regarding this film, mainly because Victor Polster is a cisgender man uh, playing Laura. So I kind of get that. Uh, the main problem I have with the film is why couldn't they find a real transgender girl to play this role? But I think this has to do with, for whatever reason, the role had to be someone who knows how to do ballet. And Victor Polster really knows how to do ballet by the looks of it. Um, so maybe that trumped the option of, you know, maybe you have a really great transgender woman to play Lara, but she can't dance as well as Victor. But then you have Victor, who's really good at ballet, but he's cisgender. So it's like, I don't know. I'm not entirely sure because I haven't, unfortunately, had the chance to talk to um, the director, Lucas Dant. Um, which is definitely one of the questions that I would have asked is like, why didn't you go for a transgender actor? Because obviously that's, that's a big thing at the moment. Um, and I really, I really enjoyed this film because it is beautiful, but also harrowing, you know, it's, it's really important to see because these issues are important. But on the other hand, obviously, I can't really comment on whether the depiction of this ordeal is authentic and realistic because I have no experience with it. And I, I do know some transgender people, but I, you don't really talk to transgender people about their change in their surgery because that is something you're not supposed to ask um, as much as I am curious about these things. But... I'm not sure what the depiction is like and how much research they've done, whether they had any kind of tra transgender people consult on this. Um, so I'm not entirely sure how authentic and realistic the depiction is. It worked for me. Um, I definitely related to Lara and what she was going through. But like I said, if, if it's actually done the proper way I have no way of knowing and I think only a transgender person can say that and in particular someone who is going from male to female because that is what is depicted here but what is depicted here is a really fascinating story a well-performed story like the performance by Victor Polster is absolutely fantastic and the guy that plays the dad Arie Wartalter is equally as amazing because usually the parents are kind of not the villains, but they usually don't come across very well, right? They're not really as understanding and stuff. And here the dad is really trying everything. Like they're doing so much just to help out Lara and and to help Lara with not just the transition, but also with the, the, the ballet school and just with everything. And obviously the younger brother has some issues as well and everything just needs to be addressed. And as is always the case with these stories, there there will be at least one point in the film where something horrendous happens um, that is not easy to, to... What's the best word? It's not easy to endure as the viewer. Um, you can see it coming, but that doesn't diminish the effect that when it happens, it has on you. But overall... I thought it was a very positive experience, even though, of course, there are shit, shitty things happening in this as well. But overall, I walked away from it thinking of it quite positively and thinking of it as very interesting and, and fascinating and powerful and something you need to see. Um, but like I said, I am not transgender, so I can't comment on how authentic and proper it's actually been done. But I do understand why I won the Queer Palm is that what it's called? Queer Palm at the Cannes Film Festival. I really enjoyed the film, even the horrendous bits. I thought the characters were relatable, they're very grounded, they're very realistic, and that's why the film worked for me. So it's not easy to digest, so just keep that in mind. So this is definitely not a comedy, but it's also not as dark and 
potentially horrific and harrowing as you might think these films are. Overall, I thought it had quite a positive spin, a positive outlook on things. So I really recommend you go and see Girl, most definitely. It's a really, really good movie with great performances. Now we have Ash, Ash's the purest color. Um, and I'm smiling about this because I, oh, sorry, Ash is, is purest white. Ash is the purest color. <laughs> it's like blue is the warmest color. Ash is the purest color. No, Ash is the purest white. Um, because I was really excited to see this. Um, and <laughs> I went to see this with, with someone I met at the film festival and we were watching this and this film, let's see, the film is 141 minutes long and I'm not surprised. You will feel every second of it because I, I've seen like 10 out of 10 reviews of this film online and I was like, what did these people see? Like, was it an entirely different film than I've seen? Because this was one of the most boring things I've seen in a long time. I think there was even like a five minute gap where I fell asleep. So I was really looking forward to seeing this because this is what it says. So Ashes Pure is white. Heartbreak and resilience fuel this quietly epic saga in which one woman's fortitude and knack for crime carry her through a rapidly changing China. Now this sounds like it's like a tour de force for a female character that definitely sounds like right up my alley that I'm going to be interested in that. What happened is this woman and her boyfriend, well, the boyfriend basically kind of runs like a little crime syndicate somewhere. And then something happens and basically someone is trying to go like, Oh dude, you think you're the alpha? I'm going to be the alpha. I'm going to smash your face in. And then they're going to smash his face into a car. And then the girlfriend steps out and shoots somebody. And then the end result is that everyone ends up in prison. The woman, because she shot someone for five years and the guy who got his head smashed in for one year. Um, and then we see someone visiting the woman in prison. That's when I fell asleep. Um, and then I woke up and she walked out of prison. And afterwards I asked my friend, it's like, what happened with the visitor in prison? Because I think I must have fallen asleep because the, the next thing I remember, she walked out of prison and she was like, you didn't miss anything because literally nothing happened. She talked to someone who visited her. And the next thing you know is she walks out of prison five years later and that's it. I was like, what? Really weird. And then we have this woman basically go on a journey to try and find her ex-boyfriend who has been released out of prison four years earlier and he wasn't there to pick her up when she was released from prison. So we go on this journey with her, which is quite an interesting journey, but the way it's edited together and the way it's shot is so fucking boring that I really had a hard time not to fall asleep again. And I know I read these reviews afterwards where they're like, this is one of the best things that's ever come out of Asian cinema. And I was like, really? It's all about resilience and fortitude of this woman and what she has to go through to go through and change China and, and to make everything work because everyone seems to just not give a shit about her. It's like, yeah, they didn't give a shit about her because she's so boring. And I was like, I felt, I felt really bad. But I just did not care. Like certain things like th there are certain scenes in the film where she is so interesting and captivating and cheeky and just fascinating for like two minutes. And then there's like 10, 20 minutes where nothing happens. And you're like, what happened? Are we uh, okay. Hmm. Literally. You need to cut out at least half an hour out of this film, maybe more. Um, because there's every now and then there's like proper character moments where she's just one of the most amazingly cheeky motherfuckers I've ever seen. And cause she just hustles and bustles and just, you know, gets the better of everyone. She's a survivor and she gets out of every situation and it's lovely to see. It's so brilliant to see how resilient and, and, and witty and clever she is. And then there's like, 
gazillion scenes in between where you're like, why am I watching this? It's just so uneven. It is ridiculous. And everyone in the cinema was glad when the film was over. Like Literally, everyone was like, wow. Certain people just literally stormed out as soon as the first credit rolled. I was like, whoa. The guy behind me was mega twitchy because he kept kicking my chair and I was like, fuck it hell. Uh, so even at press screening, you don't get people with manners, unfortunately. But overall, it's one of those films where you're like, we walked out and my mate was like, what was the point of all of this? I was like, I have no idea. And it took me a while to go like, you know what, when you think about it, she was just being very resilient and just working through all the shit that life threw at her. And she just would never, ever give up, which is great, which makes for, would make for a great film, make for a great character, make for a great story. But if you've got boring interludes of like 10, 20 minutes in between that, you're going to lose your audience. And that's exactly what happened. Maybe this is like an Asian thing. Maybe they're more patient than us. Uh, because obviously I have a huge thing with pacing in films. Everything needs to be quick. Even though when I think about Colette, that film isn't very quick. But I was captivated by the performances. And yeah, so this one, it just doesn't work. There's just too much fat in between. Where, yeah, I literally, I was just like, I'm, I'm just going to fall asleep. Like, I'm really trying not to. But there was one scene where I just fell asleep and I was like, how much did I actually miss? And I was like, you missed fuck all. So it's, it's really, really bad considering that everyone and their dog seems to be raving about this film. I was utterly bored, not disappointed, bored by this film. And it has a female lead in it and she is, she's great when she is allowed to be great. But that is just a bunch of scenes here and a bunch of scenes there. And there's a lot of shit in between where I was like, why am I watching this? You know, if, if, if I want to see a train ride through half of China where I'm not seeing out of the window. Like, but why would I want to do that? Why? It's not interesting. And like all her skills that she uses to survive after she's come out of prison and to find her boyfriend. That's actually really interesting. But like I said, there's too much shit in between. That's not interesting. And that just kills the entire film. So overall, I did not like this. I was bored beyond belief. Even May the Devil Take You was more interesting than this. Because that film was at least ridiculously, ludicrously, shittily funny. Um, but this one is just boring unfortunately but that is just me and a bunch of other people um there's a bunch of people on the internet that really like this film i think it's, it's the bee sneeze uh i wish a bee had sneezed and i would have woken me up lazy now this is uh and i say it because i am part of the lgbt community this is another lgbt film 65 and mm, I don't think because of that, but definitely not despite of it, I really liked it. It stars uh, Chloe Sevigny and uh, Kristen Stewart. Uh, and I, when I tweeted my initial thoughts of that, I got a lot of uh, recognition on Twitter, which was quite nice. So Lizzie, let's see. Chloe Sevigny and Kristen Stewart captivate in this bodice-ripping retelling of the strange and fascinating case of Lizzie Borden. So... Um, in case you don't know about the Borden case, um, Lizzie Borden in the early 20th century was accused. Was she actually acquitted? I can't remember. I th did, did they let her go? I think they let her go. Um, she was accused of killing her mom. Well, well, her dad and her stepmom uh, with an axe. Um, so. Obviously, back then, that that was, I mean, even nowadays, it would probably be a horrendous thing. But nowadays, we're, we're, we're just getting so used to Saw movies that now no one really gives a shit whether someone gets axe murdered or not. Back then, that was a horrific thing. Um, she was from a well-to-do family. They weren't poor. And she was already older. Uh, I, I can't remember. Was she, like, in her... Th she was unmarried, but I think she was, like, in her 30s or something. 
um, and she kind of she got on really well with the maid who's played by so Lizzie is played by Chloe Zimini and um, uh, thingy Bridget is played by Kristen Stewart and Kristen Stewart plays the maid um, and there's something happening between these two which is why it's a bit LGBT not much but just a, like a teeny tiny bit um, both of these women are fantastic um, Chloe Zimini and Kristen Stewart I, I mean I know that Kristen Stewart people either love her or hate her I fall into the love category because I yeah I think she's great uh, she's a great actor um, especially the older she gets the better she gets I find her quite fascinating there's just something about her it's probably a look thing I don't know it's, it's like with Kira Knightley I always liked the way that Kira Knightley looked and a, a lot of people go like no she's got a weird look it's like I like it same with Kristen Stewart people go like she's gonna be a weird look I like it uh, there's just something about her eyes that I find interesting and fascinating. Um, same with Kira Knightley. Um, Chloe Minnie and uh, Kristen Stewart play the two female leads in this. So this is also like a female-led film, which is also obviously why I was quite interested in it. Um, it's a pe another period piece uh, of which I'm not a huge fan. But the way that it works, it's, it's like a film that where women are rallying against the patriarchy which is obviously something that funny enough is quite timely nowadays in 2018 uh with the whole me too movement and stuff like that uh and that it's lgbt is obviously really good and i just love the performances in this um we have um i was mixing that up fiona shaw is in colette i didn't actually mention that sorry but i thought fiona shaw was really good um, this is basically about the, the Borden case. Like I said, she was accused of killing her dad and her stepmom. She never really had a good relationship with either of them. And then Maggie, aka Bridget, they always called their mates Maggie, but her actual name was Bridget. Um, she was, as was often the case back then and potentially nowadays, um, she was sexually abused by the man of the house uh, because that was just a given. That is the class system that is what a maid had to go through you know like the babysitter and you know all of that stuff and a lot of things just obviously didn't sit very well with Lizzie she was um, also feeling very entitled uh, her dad was quite rich and she knew that she would inherit that oh by the way Kim Dickens is in this that's what it was I knew there was a notable other person in that Kim Dickens plays the older sister of Lizzie uh, I, I love Kim Dickens. Uh, last time I've seen her was in Fear the Walking Dead. Um, one of many, many shows and projects that she's been in. She's a phenomenal actress as well. So this this is basically about what leads up to the killing of the Bordens. And Lizzie being accused of it and what actually happened and how it came about. And the way that it's told is like we, we see the aftermath of the massacre so to say um, at the very start of the film this kind of like sets the mood of this is what the film is about and then we go she's being interviewed by detectives or something and then we go back to what has actually happened and we see this entire lead up to finally then the massacre of these two individuals and I, like I said I'm not spoiling anything I don't really want to give anything away the film lives off its performances. There's not a lot of suspense because obviously you know exactly what's going to happen. Um, and the film is definitely not trying to tell you she didn't do it. It's just how she's getting away with it, so to speak. Um, and it's, it's more about the relationships between the individual people, not just between Lizzie and Bridget, but also between Lizzie and her dad, between Lizzie and her stepmom, between Bridget and the dad and Bridget and the stepmom. Um, and then there's an uncle that comes in and basically <coughs> makes everything blow up. Um, and then given the time period that is set in, everything was just basically destined to majorly fuck up. And how that eventually happens is shown at the end of the film and like I said I don't want to give anything away but I love how that is depicted the um th there's an interesting dynamic that the film has between Lizzie 
and Bridget falling for a sort of falling for each other um, be, because obviously they're, they're kind of kindred spirits not that they're similar in age it feels like the mate Bridget is a lot younger than Lizzie she can't read so Lizzie kind of shows her how to read and they write letters to each other and this this whole like high school thing is like yeah, passing letters here and passing letters there and this it, it's it's kind of like surviving in this patriarchal system that the father has established um and you you kind of become partners in crime before they even become proper partners in crime um and it's just really interesting to see all the dynamics between them and they eventually it's not a spoiler um lizzie borden was supposedly was gay um she has a bit of an affair with the maid um and you see that depicted as well quite tamely and then later on when the murders happen the murders happen not very tamely you know and this is quite interesting how everything is set up and filmed like when they have sex you you don't see any skin they have sex through their clothing um and when the murders happen everything turns very animalistic and natural the murders happen with people being nude uh, making it easier to wash the blood off and stuff like that and it's it's that juxtaposition of the sex happens fully clothed but the murder happens in the nude was was quite interesting um and just how everything just happens near the end and how how it's set up and thought out and the entire process of it but it's not just the actual murders that the film is focusing on it's more focusing on the entire scenario and the situation that the characters find themselves in and I feel like it's not very out of place with where a person might potentially feel themselves nowadays uh, even though it is a period piece like I said it's also quite timely and it totally lifts off its performances if Kristen Stewart and Chloe Sevigny weren't as strong as they are I think this film could easily fall into the boredom category because there's not actually a lot happening it's all about interpersonal relationships um, and a lot of like intrigue and scheming going on and a lot of subtext and layers um, so you really need to pay attention but I was fully engaged by the entire film but that might be because I liked the two actresses anyway then I was very surprised to see Kim Dickens in this as well um, and then obviously I knew that it had LGBT undertones which is always a plus for me so it might not necessarily work for everybody but I had a lot of fun with it even though that sounds weird when you talk about this kind of a film but I loved it for the performances I really did um, the score I can't tell you because I don't remember so I think it was quite effective there's also quite a lot of scenes where there's no score at all where there's no sound whatsoever at all and I think that worked really effectively but every now and then it's taken a bit too much like over the top but I did enjoy the film. I wasn't bored in the slightest. I was always quite with it. I really wanted to see is like what what's Lizzie going to do next? What's Bridget going to do next? Or what's Lizzie going to make Bridget do next? Those kinds of things and it's it's kind of like that kind of a dynamic that's that's happening there. Um and then just putting the puzzle pieces together is like why does she eventually kill her dad and her stepmom how does she do it what did what was the thought process of how she thought she was going to get away with it so all of that it's, it's kind of like watching Viola Davis in how to get away with murder almost um so it's a really interesting film I really enjoyed it do you need to watch it on the big screen I don't think so not necessarily it's, it's not like it's got grand vistas or anything like that this is definitely a film you can easily check out on video on demand or on blu-ray or something like that you don't necessarily need to go and see it in the cinema unless you just want to support something like this um, which I think is always worthwhile um, so go and check that out let's see um, Lizzie is on Saturday the 13th and Saturday the 20th uh, it has two further screenings the other one was uh, earlier this evening today 
Um, so go and check out Lizzie. If you like Kristen Stewart, if you like Chloe Sevigny, if you like period drama, if you like something a bit more like feminist against patriarchy kind of a thing, I think this film will work for you. If you're looking for the tiniest bit of LGBT entertainment, this might work for you as well, even though the LGBT bit is about that big, literally. Hi, Gabriel, how are you doing? Um, so not necessarily an LGBT film, even though it's got a tiny bit in there, but I loved it for the performances of the two female leads, uh, especially Kristen Stewart. I thought it was really, really good. So on to the next one. What's this? A Kesha. Let's have a look. That was a film that wasn't really on my list, and I watched it because I literally just walked into the screening room and it was screening. I was there, it was screening, and I watched it. Let's see, Akasha, with his striking, gently comedic debut, set amidst an endless war in his beloved country, Hajuj Kuka, who is the director, announces himself as one of Sudan's most unique cinematic voices. Now, we have a guy, <coughs> excuse me, called Atnan, which is this guy on the poster. He's a revolutionary soldier. And he seems to be famous for having shot down a MiG fighter plane, like it's a Russian fighter plane, with his beloved AK-47 uh, called Nancy. Um, and he really loves his gun. Like, he cleans his gun religiously, and he's just, like, like enamored with this gun. So every time that... Um, I can't remember, is it autumn or whatever, when the rainy season starts, people basically stop having war. They go home and tend to the fields. And then when the rain stops, then they start fighting each other again, which is kind of interesting. I didn't know that. So there's like fighting going on and then the rainy season starts. So he goes home to help his dad on the farm. And then the rainy season stops and he's supposed to move his ass back to his military unit, but he doesn't. He hangs out with his girlfriend, uh, what's her girlfriend? Lena. And then the military starts looking for him and a lot of other people that haven't come back because basically people just don't want to shoot other people. Funny that. Um, and it's this really comedic approach about how he is trying to dodge going back to the military, even though he doesn't mind going back to the military because everyone thinks he's, he's like a hotshot because he shot down a MiG fighter plane, even though they, it's not actually a MiG fighter plane. They said it's a drone and a MiG fighter plane actually has a pilot in it. Yeah. In the film, they say he shot down a drone, whatever it is. Um, and the film is supposed to be really funny. Uh, it's in the Oh, no, it's not in the laugh category. It's in the dare category. But it's a really comedic look at the entire setting. So what happens is he's with his girlfriend and then he has a falling out with the girlfriend and the girlfriend kicks him out but doesn't hand him his AK-47 bag. So Nancy is still in his girlfriend's hut and he's just been kicked out. And this is where the film falls down for me. It's like, for whatever reason... He doesn't just go back in there and grab his fucking gun and go back to the military the way he wants to. He he adheres to his girlfriend's wishes and doesn't step into the hut where his gun is. So he runs into someone who's actually a deserter from the military and goes like, okay, mate, look, I'm going to like help you out if you help me out and get my gun Nancy out of my girlfriend's hut. And then from there on, this supporting character, uh, what's his name? Uh, Apsi, right. What, what's his name, Apsi? He's another deserter. They, they hatch a plan to get the gun back. Um, and then they're saying it turns into a romantic drama, which is something that I do not agree with because I think the film is, is just a farcical comedy where Apsi who is the supporting character is so much more interesting and captivating than Adnan, who is supposed to be the lead. Um, be because he's just ridiculous, this Apsi guy. And he's so awesome. He comes up with all kinds of weird ass things. Like they dress up as women um, to, to try and get the gun back. And it, it's like a lot of really ludicrous shit happens there. Um, and it is very farcical. It's almost like Mr. Bean or like Johnny English or something. It's really, really stupid and silly. But it kind of works, with the exception that I just, I can't see this Atnan guy as the lead because he's just so boring and everyone's into him because he's a pretty boy. And I'm just like, 
I don't get it. I really didn't get it. I thought the supporting guy, the absent guy was so much more interesting and, and captivating. But this is basically the premise of the film. He got thrown out by the girlfriend. He runs into Apsi and goes, Apsi, if you get my gun back, I'm going to help you out. And the entire time they're running away from the military because they're now both look, uh, looked at as deserters, which is obviously something you, you don't want to happen because I think they shoot you dead if you're a deserter. So not very healthy. So this is the premise of the film. And then some, like I said, some ludicrous, ridiculous stuff is happening. Overall, it is quite charming and funny but it's also so over the top silly that it, it's just not really it didn't feel grounded in reality for me at all it felt very farcical and certain things are just happening because the script says so and I have a huge problem with that um, because certain things they, they just don't flow well narratively so the, the film failed that a bit for me unfortunately. It's still not a waste of time, but I wouldn't go out of my way to go and see this. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it either. Like, if, if you want to see a film with a bunch of black people in it that is kind of half-heartedly entertaining, definitely check it out. But if you want something with grounded characters and a grounded story, even in a comedy, right, um, then this isn't for you. This, this is just so ridiculous and over the top, slapsticky that I, I just couldn't relate to it, unfortunately. So overall, I was a bit like, what did I just watch and why the hell did I just watch it? So hit and miss, I would say, depending on your mood in the day. Oh, hi, Fanny. How are you doing? Um, depending on your mood, whether you're looking for some lighthearted entertainment. Hey, yeah, lady. That might that might work for you. Overall, I wanted my comedy a bit more grounded in that regard. Um, maybe I'm just too far disassociated from African culture. Maybe I just didn't understand it or didn't get it. Maybe I'm just not the target audience. But overall, I thought the film was a bit lackluster. Yeah, great to see you too. All right, let's see. Above the Clouds, this is actually not at London Film Festival. This was my number one film at Raindance Film Festival. And I know I said I was going to talk about London Film Festival, but this is like a, a tiny bit of an excursion. Um, you can't actually check this out at London Film Festival, unfortunately. But I do hope it gets a proper theatrical run here in, the Brit uh, here in Britain. Uh, it's a British road movie. And it's so beautiful and charming and positive and, and life affirming and, and just amazing with great, charming, captivating, brilliant performances by what's, his, what's her name? Naomi Morris plays like an 18 year old girl. And we have Andrew Merton who plays like a homeless guy. And she, through a weird coincidence, finds out that her dad's not actually her dad. Um, and she has a theory who might be her dad. And this dude, for whatever reason, lives in the Isle of Skye. And her so-called stepdad um, just handed her a new car, but she doesn't have a full driver's license yet. So in order to drive up to the Isle of Skye, she needs a responsible adult, which is where Homeless Beauty Guy comes in. And together they go on one of the most amazing and charming British road trips I have ever seen. This is a brilliant road trip, road trip movie with a lot of character moments and brilliant dialogue and great performances. And it's just so darling and sweet and, and cute while also being really profound and, and poignant and, and, and important. And it's, it's like a coming of age story sort of or, or becoming an adult story or finding out who you really are and what's important. Oh, yeah, Fanny, I think you'd love that. It's a really good film. Um, I'm not I don't think it actually has a proper release date for the UK yet, but I do hope that a distributor picked it up at Raindance because this film was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I, I can't recommend it often enough. It was just pure coincidence that I... I managed to get to, to watch that. And when I walked into the cinema, I actually 
just by by chance, I was like two minutes late or something. The movie had already started. And you know when you traps around uh, through the darkened cinema and you're like, shit, I can't. Like I'm such a nuisance. I'm walking around in front of a screen and stuff. I was like, I need to sit down. And I saw a seat at the very top in the very corner, literally corner corner. I was like, okay. I usually don't sit there because it's a shitty seat. I was like, well, I'm late and I'm really sorry. So I traipsed up there and I sat down. And the girl next to me, she gave me a weird look. She was like, why are you sitting here? And I was like, well, it's the only plan. You know, it was like, hmm? It's like, hmm. Huh. That, that's literally all it was. And then I proceeded to just watch the film. And I, and I loved it. I thought it was really good. Like, all the characters in, in the film are really darling and really well acted and really grounded and just superb. And then halfway through the film, um, something happens. I'm not going to say what it is. And, you know, because you're in the corner, you watch the film slightly sideways, right? So you out of the corner of your eye, you see the people right next to you. And lo and behold, long story short, it turns out I ended up sitting right next to the two leads. I was sitting next to Naomi Morris and Andrew Upton without realizing it. And then halfway through the film, I was like, that guy looks really, that guy two seats down looks really familiar. And the girl right next to me also looks really familiar. And then you watch it and like, I'll play some of the film. I was like, shit, I think I'm sitting right next to, right next to the guys who are in the film. I was like, wow, someone's spamming me with hearts. <laughs> Love it. Um, yeah. So I was like, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not allowed to sit here. I was like, well, no one's complaining, right? Brilliant story. Oh, wow. Thank you. Um, and then the film was over and they had the director there and the cast and they were doing this whole Q&A thing. It's like, yeah, and now I want Naomi and Andrew to come down. And who gets up? The two people right next to me. And I'm like, whoopsie. <laughs> yeah, I did say, it's like, I loved your movie. <laughs> um, and I was like, that's when she was looking at me really weird. It's like, yeah, I'm not cast. I'm not crew. I'm just like, this is the last seat there is. And I really want to sit down to see the movie. And it was totally worth it because this film was really fantastic. And I highly recommend it to everyone. Like, it doesn't even, hey, Mitch, how you doing? Um, it, it doesn't matter what... Um, no, I lost it. It, it, it doesn't matter what uh, mood you're in, whether you're in a good mood or in a shitty mood, this movie is going to put you in a good mood because it's just so darling. And if you're an actor, you're going to appreciate Hamish. If you're an actor, you're going to appreciate the, the performances in it. And it's just such a feel-good movie and, and a happy movie. And it will just leave you with like a lot of positive feelings and, and like a go-get attitude and like... It, it's it's a journey, you know, that car ride, that road trip is a huge journey from, I think she starts in London or something and goes all the way up to the Isle of Skye and that obviously takes quite a while and there's like ups and downs happening and they're meeting new characters and how they influence you and how you overcome obstacles and, and you find out about other people and you learn about yourself and it's just th that kind of a thing in a nutshell. And it's what a beautiful, beautiful film. So if you get to see that, and I know Rain Dance is over now, but I do hope it gets a general release because this film is absolutely worth to be seen in the cinema because it's just so beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. All right. Above the clouds. Remember that one. And now just a, <coughs> just a quick um, plug for my friend uh, Kate Davies. Ooh. Kate Davies speak now. Um, she had a screening of a new film, The Barge People, uh, which is by Dark Temple Films, the guys who also did uh, Escape from Cannibal Farm. And I've seen that like a week or two ago. I can't remember. Um, it's really good. Like, I'm not much into like the horror genre, if you've ever seen me talk about movies, right? But this is a really good horror film. Proper homage to like the 70s and 80s horror movies. Um, and it works really well. And the characters are stereotypical but fucking brilliant and the action is great and 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 the hack and slash and the horror is good and it's just a proper progression from escape from can cannibal farm 
onto the barge people. It's really, really good. Um, I can't wait for you guys to see it. If you liked Escape from Cannibal Farm, you're going to love this one as well. All right, so go and check it out. And if you've not seen Escape from Cannibal Farm, you can order that from Amazon now. And it's totally worth it. Trust me on that. Uh, what do we have here? Oh, yeah, quickly, uh, while I'm, you know, pitching, uh, not pitching out my friends. What's the word? Well, pimping out my friends. Uh, there's a new web series called Rebecca Gold by my friend Ian. Um, if you're like into special agent stuff with a female lead, go and check it out. It's called Rebecca Gold. Gold is in the color. Uh, check it out on YouTube. And now I have to go back because it's been sorting it the wrong way. We're almost through, so we have three more left. This is Back to London Film Festival. This is Queen of Fear. Uh, which is, I think, an Argentinian film, if I'm not entirely mistaken. This is another one of the films that I just ended up watching by chance, and it totally got me. Like, I was so mesmerized by it. Again, if you are an actor or you're into great performances, this is a film for you, because the leading lady, uh, Queen of Fear, Queen of Fear, Leading lady's name was Valeria Bertuccelli, and she also directed and co-wrote it. Um, she's absolutely phenomenal in this film. Uh, it's absolutely brilliant what she does there. Um, she is the queen of fear because she's got a lot of phobias and stuff, and you're introduced to that right within the first five minutes um, of the film. And in, in like a really... I don't want to see a cute way, but like in a really darling and... and um, characteristic way really captivating and even though that she is a bit potentially neurotic and and phobic and all of that stuff but she does that in a really charming way and you can kind of understand why people cut her a lot of slack and just let her get away with it and then throughout the film you find out that she is a celebrity she's an actor who's putting on a theater play and she doesn't really know what the theater play is supposed to be uh, about so she's kind of winging it <laughs> and she's got a lot of money involved in it people are financing it and, and people are asking her all these questions and she's like I don't know we'll do this we'll do that and she literally wings it like left right and center and it's, it's brilliant to see and everyone just buys whatever she says it's, it's amazing and then of course there's going to be a curveball uh, thrown in there one of her best friends that she hasn't spoken to in a while um, he ends up getting cancer or the cancer comes back or something like that and that totally throws her and obviously gives her perspective and she immediately like leaves everything and goes and sees him and he lives in does he live in the states if i'm not mistaken and they're in argentina so it's quite quite a, a distance away and it, it gives her perspective and 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 uh, an emphasis on the things that are really important um and at the same time, she's still going through this whole, like all her phobias that she thinks that someone is trying to break into her house and it's just her and the maid. And the maid is also slightly neurotic and she has to deal with the maid as well. It's like there's some brilliant, brilliant scene work happening in this film where she's on her way into the theater and she's just walking into the theater and she's not really walked into the theater in months. And then the director is like really happy to see her and we, we're going to rehearse and we're going to go through props and blocking and all of that stuff. And she's on the phone to her maid who's just having a nervous breakdown. And she literally walks up the stairs to the stage and then walks them back down because she's like, don't worry, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm on my way. We're going to sort all of this out. And the director in the background was like, hey, well, what the now? Um, and it's, I'm not doing it justice. Just trust me on that. This film is absolutely phenomenal just because of, the, of Valeria Berticelli. She makes it all work. It sounds so weird and, and, and kind of like self-involved and and almost like pretentious and, and artsy-fartsy and all of that shit. But it actually works and it's really funny as well because she is just such a... I don't really want to say diva, even though she is diva-ish. But she it's because she's really charming. She gets away with a lot. Um, and she's got all these skeletons in the closet and she's got all these problems and and like i said these idiosyncrasies and phobias she has to deal with and and 
because she's some she's a celebrity she's got a bit of money so you know how, what rich people are like where they're like oh and just do this and just do that and blah 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 and they always think that you can fix everything for them just as long as you pay enough um she does all of that in a really charming way and she's absolutely hilarious and so much is just happening in her face um and obviously the film is argentinian so there's it's subtitles so there might be a lot of like subtleties and nuances that that might be um left in the translation unfortunately we, we we might not be privy to that it's stuff like that where i'm always like why don't i understand the language which is a bit annoying every now and then you pick up a word but it's just not the same but the film is absolutely phenomenal um let's see when else does it show so wednesday yeah that's over oh bollocks thursday that was today so that film unfortunately has run through all the screenings it had it screened yesterday and today uh, earlier this afternoon um, so maybe you can catch it on on DVD or Blu-ray or something like that hopefully someone's gonna pick it up it's not one that's been picked up by Netflix there's quite a few films that are in distribution by Netflix so that it's like Roma for example Alfonso Cuaron's new film is going to be distributed by Netflix the new Coen Brothers one is going to be on Netflix as well hey Reds how you doing um, so yeah the new Coen Brothers one Roma there's a bunch of other films that have been picked up by Netflix so you can get them on Netflix so including Netflix UK obviously because it's a Netflix production so it's worldwide on Netflix which is quite nice I don't think Roma has a release date yet on Netflix um, there's also I think a documentary on Orson Welles that's been picked up by Netflix so good to hear you are being good um, so shame about Queen of Fear having run its course already definitely put this um, like it's called La Reina del Miedo I don't speak Spanish unfortunately so sorry for slaughtering it um, but if you find that anywhere I highly recommend it it's, it's very entertaining even though there's some tragic shit happening in it as well um, but just for the performance brilliant the entertainment value in the film absolutely phenomenal it's really really funny considering it's called the queen of fear um so yeah i highly recommend that what else we got mandy okay <laughs> so this is a film where i have a bit of a a different um what's the word a, a different opinion to pretty much everyone else uh which is actually it happens quite a lot um Mandy is uh, Nicolas Cage gives perhaps his most unhinged performance yet in this wild psychedelic slice of ultra violence for the ages and uh, psychedelic most definitely I sometimes say like certain films especially horror films you need to kind of be on drugs in order to really appreciate them like you need to have a party with your friends at home you watch it on Netflix you're all drunk you're, you're eating food and you can throw shit at the TV and you can yell and scream and no one really cares. That kind of a film. That's sort of what Mandy is like as well. Um, but I would go even further. It's like I know it's, it's going on a crazy rampage of a theatrical run in the States at the moment. It is going bonkers. And I think it's doing the same thing here in the UK as well. It has cult film written all over it. But I have a huge problem with it. And that is that the first half hour is fucking boring. The whole set, like a setup that another film would do in five to ten minutes takes at least half an hour in this film. And it's so tedious and boring. I was sitting there going like, I really want to leave. But I never leave because... <coughs> Because you never know what the film might turn out to be. And I'm in the instance of Mandy, I'm quite glad that I stayed. Because the film goes mental in a good way in the second half. Um, but I had one reviewer who was sitting right next to me. She up and left after like 20 minutes. Um, and it really takes its time with the, the, the setup of everything. With the characters and where you are. And even though it does take its time... Ooh, and even though it does take its time, there was something that I really didn't pick up on. 
and that is that Mandy doesn't take place on Earth. It takes place on a different planet. And I thought that all these, these weird, like, map paintings that are stitched in and stuff, I was like, that's just Nicolas Cage going crazy, or that's the director trying to tell us something. Yeah, the director was trying to tell you, Mel, that this is not on Earth, and you did not pick up on it. So, I don't know, maybe I was tired. But apparently that is what it is. Let's see what it says here. See, it only says, in a mountain cabin ideal, lumberjack Rad Miller lives in perfect harmony with his great love, Mandy. But the couple is blissful utopia is cruelly shattered when a ragtag band of satanic cultists invade their humble abode and claim Mandy for their own. Traumatized and destroyed, Red is left with no option but to exact a bloody revenge. And that's pretty much what it is. So once he starts on his rampage and revenge, the film gets really good and turns into a hacker slasher psychedelic feast of the senses which is ludicrously bonkers and amazing and I seem to be using this word a lot ludicrous and bonkers um, but it really embraces what it is which is cuckoo but up until that point I was like why are you taking so long showing me that they're a lovey-dovey couple that doesn't take 20-30 minutes does it crazy other people coming in also doesn't take forever it's like, why are you taking forever to show me this? I really have no bloody idea. Um, so when the girlfriend finally gets fridged, because the girlfriend always gets fridged in a fucking horror movie, right? I didn't even fault the film for that. I was like, thank fuck, because that either means it's finally going to start getting going, or I wish I was her so this would be over, because it was torture until that point. It was really, really bad. But it's also not a very misogynistic film. It's like, it's actually quite, you know, the only nudity you see in the film is front, full frontal nudity of a man who's being laughed at by a woman, which is why everything goes tits up pretty much. Um, and then Nicolas Cage literally sees the love of his life burned to death, um, or fr the, the opposite of Fridged, um, the hot version of Fridged. And then he goes on a rampage trying to find the people that did that to her. And that's when it becomes really interesting because it goes mental. It literally goes fucking mental. And you know how there's like all these memes on the internet where it's like Nicolas Cage going crazy. And this is the film where Nicolas Cage goes crazy. Like over the top crazy. Uh, that's the kind of film it is. And it fully embraces that. And there's like one ridiculously silly over the top ludicrous scene after the next after the next after the next until you're finally at the end of the film and you're like what the fuck was that for me i enjoyed the crazy shit because it is just outlandishly crazy it's it's, it's like i don't know george miller meets david lynch meets romero something like that is really bonkers it's really amazing it's really fucking fantastic but i can't forgive the first half hour which is so tedious and lengthy and boring and it's like nothing's happening what the hell is up with all of this shit it, it's it's like the last hour is your reward for sitting through the first half hour so it's like ugh horrible absolutely horrible so when you go and see this film you know how the movie starts at 8 and you rock up at 8 30 because you don't want to see the commercials you don't want to see the trailers and the other commercials people pay a lot of money for you just want to go and see the film so you rock up half an hour late so just make it an hour for mandy and you will arrive at the perfect time where the girlfriend gets fridged and nicholas cage goes mental and that is all you want to see from there on, really good film. It's, it's going to play at the PCC for decades because that's the kind of film it is. It's got cult written all over it. But the first half hour, snip, snip. That's all I'm saying. Let's see if we can cut this out because no one needs to see my clothing. Um, let's see. Director Benedict Aringson's follow-up to the eccentric comedy of Horses and Men is a similar genre-fluid trip playfully steeped in Iceland's heritage and landscape. So this film takes place in Iceland, which is why it's kind of interesting to see. Uh, it's really pretty, really beautiful. It's also a bit 
silly in regards to how the narrative is structured. But we have um, a feisty 40-something Hella, who's the lead la leading lady, the actual woman at war. Uh, she leads a double life as an undercover environmental activist. She's declared a one-woman war on the local aluminium industry to protect her homeland's pristine highlands. As Hala's acts of sabotage grow ever more extreme, Ellingson ingeniously blends the traditional with the modern, using the most idiosyncratic of soundtracks to mine a unique sense of humor, but never detracting from the gravitas of the campaign. And the leading lady is absolutely fantastic. Leading lady is uh, Haldora Gainharas Dochir. I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing this right. Um, the way that it is structured is just, she seems to be a normal person and then she turns into like a vigilante slash activism person, uh, like, I said, like the synopsis says, where she's trying to save the pristine highlands of Iceland. And some of the stuff that happens there is just amped up to the extreme because it, while it is trying to um, put a finger on and, and point a finger at the problems that are happening there in regards to the environment and, and industrialization and stuff like that, but it also knows that it's trying to do that in a funny way. So there's a lot of laugh out loud moments in this film. And one of the things that happens there is like, especially in regards to the score, the score is, I assume, very Icelandic. I've never been to Iceland, so I'm not entirely sure. But you have a bunch of women singing in the background. You actually see them singing in the background. They have nothing to do with the scene whatsoever. But because that bit of the score now starts, the director ends up showing that bit in, in the film as well. So the score starts and you actually see these people singing or the score starts and you see a band in the background that all of a sudden shows up um, because the camera pans into something. So in the most ludicrous spaces, all of a sudden you have a choir, you have a band, you have whatever it is. They will just randomly show up. And that makes it kind of hilarious as well. It's like that adds to the comedy bit of it. And it really, really works. And it doesn't detract from the seriousness that the activism is supposed to show. And the uh, the actress is just absolutely phenomenal. And the payoff is really good. And I, I really thoroughly enjoyed this film. It is just so weird and bizarre, especially in regards of how how it includes the the musicality the the score the even the sound effects they they will have a real place in the scene that you're seeing whether it makes sense for that to actually be present in the scene or not and the lead actors or, or the actors will not basically adhere to what they're seeing like you, you they will not notice that there is a choir standing there, that there's a band standing there or whatever it is, even though they're clearly there. Um, so that's an interesting choice that I think I've never seen happen in a movie. So I really, really enjoyed that bit of it. it is, like I said, it's a bit bizarre. It's a bit over the top, but it does so in a, in an entertaining way. And it doesn't detract from what it's trying to show you from the actual message of the film. The performances are really good. There are several running gags throughout the entire film. And it's just, it, it, it's as charming as something as Hunt for the Wilder People, which is so very New Zealandish. And Woman at War is just so very Icelandish. You know, it's, it's just absolutely phenomenal. So if you're into that kind of, if you want to watch like a really bizarre comedy that doesn't go into the grotesque, this is definitely the film to watch. So the highlights for me, um, because I've not done the show in two weeks, uh, I can't really say uh, film of the week, but the, the highlights for me were definitely Colette, uh, which I watched earlier today, because that really had me buzzing after I walked out of the cinema. Um, I think, yeah. What was after that? I'm sorry to bother you. Yeah, those were two films that I've seen today. And I think those are actually my movies of the week. I also really thoroughly enjoyed Lizzie. Um, if you haven't seen the Bill Murray stories yet, I was talking about this like two weeks ago in the other 
uh, LFF overview that you can find on YouTube. That's a really, really good do documentary that I highly recommend. Uh, same with Crystal Swans, a fantastic film as well. So definitely go and check out Colette. What else we got? Don't go and check out Sorry to Bother You. Styx was fantastic. Border is something you can't miss. I think it will be a top runner up for the uh, for an Oscar for a language Oscar. Girl, if you're into transgender issues, uh, great performances. Gift is a miss. Ash is pure as white. Lizzie, I thought was fantastic. Akasha, I would give a miss. Above the clouds, not at LFF, but definitely a brilliant film, and about people and so forth. But yeah, for me. Definitely the movie of the week would be Colette, I think. Colette and Sorry to Bother You. So go and give that, uh, give that a watch if you can still get tickets. Uh, tomorrow I will be watching The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is a new Cohen film. Uh, I think we're going to go interview a bunch of people for that as well. Sorry, my nose is clogging up, so I'm still a bit sick. Uh, there will be more coverage uh, potentially on here uh, before next Thursday. Next Thursday is going to be another I Love Cinema. Don't forget regular cinema. If you don't go to LFF, the first man, uh, first man is out, which is the story about the moon landing starring Ryan Gosling and Claire Foy. We also have Johnny English uh, out again. Uh, the Wife is Out with Glenn Close. I haven't seen it yet, but it's supposed to be phenomenal. I mean, because Glenn Close is phenomenal. And I think that's it. No, there's something else out that I can't think of right now. I will let you know. Follow me on Twitter, Melanie underscore Radloff, R A D L O double F for Foxtrot. Uh, or just follow I Love Cinema Vlog, all one word, on Twitter. It will link you to my, um, my Twitter, uh, Melanie Radloff. Uh, check out I Love Cinema, hashtag I Love Cinema on YouTube for all the videos. I'm going to be uploading this onto YouTube soonish. Uh, you can find in the description of the video on YouTube the time index where every single film starts because obviously I don't expect you to watch two hours. Uh, so yes, yeah, stay tuned for more coverage soon. Potentially tomorrow, potentially the next few days. I'm not entirely sure. Uh, it's very like, you know, ad hoc is all I can say. But hopefully next Thursday and from next Thursday onwards, even though the LFF is still running, I'll be able to do I Love Cinema in the regular time slot Thursdays at 8 p.m. But we'll see how that goes. And uh, yeah, have fun in the cinema. Let me know what you've been watching, what you think, what you like, what you don't like. Are you going to LFF? What are the films that you want to watch? Maybe you've seen some films already. Let me know what you think. Um, what are your thoughts on Colette? Well, you thought some widows, sorry to bother you, and all the other films that were screening today. So let me know. Uh, say hi if you see me at LFF. Um, and yeah, let's go and watch some movies. Have a great weekend, a great LFF. See you next week.